This is a rare look too, and it's also a local success story. As you can see, this is a group that has a lot of fun on the job. Technically, they're working right now. It all began with an idea 10 years ago that no one can know would become the hottest trend in gaming. The hottest trend in gaming definitely was a lame local news way of illustrating Artix's impact on the video game industry. For almost 20 years, the Artix team has been publishing consistent weekly content for multiple titles. And if you grew up playing computer games in the 2000s, you've probably played an Artix game at one point or another. Their simplistic yet charming and wildly addictive flash games pushed the limits of what could be accomplished on the software and brought an astounding level of depth and storytelling to otherwise simple concepts. With the added challenge of developing games on a dying platform, that being Flash, Artix was tasked with continuing their projects for browsers that were phasing them out, forcing them to adapt quickly to the undeniable end of what we fondly remember as browser gaming. Thankfully, Artix played to their strengths with their indisputable ambition and passion for developing video games carrying them right on through to a new era. And that's all thanks to a phenomenal team and one man with a dream. No playing with the axe in the office. <laughs> Meet Adam Baum. From the looks of it, Adam has been living the dream since 2002. He created a wildly successful video game at the age of 24, runs a team that looks like they're having more fun making video games than anyone in the industry, got married in a suit of armor, definitely lifts, and is still doing it all to this day. And as for Artix Entertainment, the entire company feels like one big passion project. From filming their own commercials to designing their own physical products, Artix has put DIY into pretty much everything they do, while having a ridiculous amount of fun along the way. Yet somehow, they still get work done. To date, Artix has developed over a dozen titles, with many of them still receiving frequent weekly updates. Their latest title, Adventure Quest 3D, recently received a port for mobile, thus securing future profits and moving the predominantly Flash-based game devs into the current era something that not every company has been able to do easily on mobile. With so many titles having been developed, I'd be lying if I said Artix hadn't had their fair share of duds. While Artix is responsible for some of the most iconic RPGs of the 2000s, they've also produced titles like Epic Duel, Oversoul, and Hero Smash, games that have more or less faded into obscurity, save for the niche fanbase that still plays them. Yet, while some of Artix's games have stopped receiving updates, there are still an impressive number of titles going strong with a loyal following and surprisingly consistent content. One of those games, most notably being Dragon Fable, Artix's second ever published title. Released officially in 2006, Dragon Fable hit the scene as the perceived successor to the wildly popular adventure quest from four years prior. Boasting fully explorable worlds, a 2.5D movement system, and a fresh take on Adventure Quest's trademark combat mechanics, Dragon Fable postured itself to be better than Adventure Quest in every way. And critics seem to feel that sentiment, with many versions of this quote being uttered in one way or another. Now, if you were Artix, this may have read somewhat as a backhanded compliment, seeing as Dragon Fable was never truly branded as Adventure Quest's successor. Yet it also shouldn't have come as a surprise. Dragon Fable almost feels like the game Adam wanted to make in 2002, but didn't have the resources to accomplish at the time. Now, with an entire team of artists, animators, and programmers at his side, making the ultimate game was finally possible. And you can kind of grasp the feeling for that excitement when you head over to Dragon Fable's About page, where you will find the single most ridiculous game pitch I've ever read. The writer describes the TV quality art as breathtaking, and the combat as fast and furious. The game comes complete with 100% crazy style humor and playable NPCs. It is, and I quote, like someone mixed Adventure Quest and a select choice of the best games ever made into a bowl and stirred it until it was perfect. 
The page goes on to upsell their Dragon Amulet upgrade, that is just Adventure Quest's guardianship disguised under a different moniker. And not to nitpick here, but they trigger one of my biggest gaming pet peeves by attempting to allure you with the promise of powerful in-game items to boost your character. Artix is by far not the only company guilty of this. Countless mobile and free-to-play games try to tempt you with fancy cosmetics and powerful items to get you to sign up. Items that mean absolutely nothing to me if I'm a new player. I'm looking at you, World of Warships. I don't want to redeem a promotion code for 200 doubloons and a historically accurate German Nassau battleship because I forgot to turn my ad blocker on. Anyway, I digress. The release was received decently well by critics at the time. Considering the game was competing against RPG giants like World of Warcraft, MapleStory, RuneScape, and Habbo Hotel to name a few. But Artix knew who they were up against, and nothing about the game felt like it was ever vying for the title of biggest online RPG. I mean, the game wasn't massively multiplayer, and its payment model was a lot more humble than its competitors. Their one-time payment strategy for all access to items and future game content was beyond generous and still is to this day. And with weekly updates still being released, the Dragon Amulet has truly held its value. That's why I had to jump back in after an almost 15 year hiatus and start a fresh account. So with a quick boot of the launcher and my trademark username secured, I was back in the world of lore. I started by customizing my character's look and choosing my class, whereafter I was given the option of how I wanted to start my journey. Book 1, Book 2, or Book 3. Being the fan of chronology that I am, I jumped right into Book 1, the Orb Saga. And if you grew up in the 2000s playing Dragon Fable, this opening scene should bring back a few good memories. There, atop a hill, your hero, gazing over the horizon and... Okay, apparently you're fine. But right here, Dragon Fable reveals its first glimpse of Flash Game Charm, where you'll notice your hero's open mouth is just a separate asset crudely pasted over the neutral expression on your character's face. Not sure why they decided to punch in for a close-up here, but I'm glad they did because it's hilarious. After some classic fourth wall breaking dialogue, we meet Twilly and the Priestess who pass by in a hurry, leaving you on your own to explore the game's controls and there's not much to it. You have access to a map and inventory, much like Adventure Quest, but this time around you can actually navigate the world freely. A nice change of pace from being tethered to an in-game menu of point-and-click houses and castles. And that's not to say Adventure Quest had a bad user interface. Aside from the cluttered assortment of multicolored buttons and menu prompts, the game still felt open world and vast. Yet, it's hard to argue that a 10-year-old wouldn't find Dragon Fable's exploration a lot more engaging, which is definitely easy to understand. Moving on, you catch up with the Priestess and Twilly in the forest, engage in some foreshadowing dialogue, and then make your way to your first stop, Oaklore. There, at the gate, you're greeted by Sir Anno, who seems to either be significantly larger than you or challenged in the ways of perspective. Either way, he's really odd with his pointy nose and, uh, Pac-Man reference. Okay. From there, I entered the castle grounds and met with Captain Rolith, who welcomed me to Oaklore Keep, home of the Pactagonal Table. Okay, wait a minute. Are you, are you, why? I mean, why have so many Pac-Man references crammed into the first town of the game? Anyway, I scour the town to look for my first real quest and stumble upon Sir Loin, who wants me to clear Tuskmongers from his garden. Uh, these things, apparently. The entire challenge just has you running around the garden, crumpling every Tuskmonger in sight. And I don't really know if I've even completed the quest. I mean, I think I got all of them, but I never got a quest complete prompt of any kind, so... I'm most likely missing something, but I'm too impatient to care. I return to Roleth and ask him about the priestess from earlier. He says, What? Why did you not tell me sooner? Well, <laughs> you see. Roleth fears for the priestess's safety, who ended up beelining it through the forest in lieu of taking a pit stop in Oaklore. 
Thus ensues a fairly textbook quest of running through the forest, finding the priestess, and encountering the assumed villain of the story, Drakath, who warns me to stand down or I'll be blown away by the winds of his great destiny. We fight, and this is where the combat starts to pick up in difficulty. No longer am I just absentmindedly slapping monsters and looting for gold. Here I have to actually choose my next move carefully, time my potions, and use my abilities. It's simple enough, and if you're familiar with Adventure Quest, you'll notice the interface is somewhat different from the spiderweb of spells and attack options you might be used to. But it gives the same satisfaction. It's when you're tasked with slapping the same mobs over and over again that things start to get stale. And this isn't really a bad thing if you're into that sort of stuff. I'm a RuneScape player, and some of the best grinds are the ones where you can completely shut your brain off and collect gold, XP, etc. But it starts to become a problem for me when it feels like every moment in the game is just a buffer between battles. Sure, Ardix is known for their storytelling, and most DF players will tell you a big aspect of the game is the plot, but if that's not something that engages you into an experience, you might be left wanting more. Many of the combat scenarios I encountered felt like chores, with bosses and mobs acting like sponges that soak up damage until you eventually pummel them into submission. And I think at one point Ardix recognized this. In 2017 came the advent of the Inn at the Edge of Time, a combat challenge available at any level that introduced new mechanics devised to truly test a player's skill. The combat challenges are meant to be engaging, strategy-inducing, and rewarding, granting access to powerful and upgradable gear upon completion. This means players are forced to carefully strategize their approach beforehand, with one of those strategic factors being class. You see, there are a multitude of classes to choose from in Dragon Fable, with some classes being much rarer than others. You have your base classes, Warrior, Rogue, and Mage, with secondary extensions of those classes becoming unlockable upon upgrading your account with the Dragon Amulet. You can also use Dragon Coins to unlock classes from various shops around the game, meaning you can actually drop a class and pick up a new one at any time. And of course, with the advent of the Inn at the Edge of Time, players have meticulously placed all the available classes into a well-defined tier list for optimal performance. All in all, it's clearly apparent that classes play a big part in the experience of the game, and the idea of switching between different classes is definitely appealing, but uh, for the time being I think I'll have to be satisfied as an F-tier warrior. Overall, my time revisiting Dragon Fable was worth it. Is the game dated? Absolutely. Many of the areas between cities are stale, lack interaction, and the combat struggles to sustain my interest. But is this really the fault of a 15-year-old RPG browser game running on dead software? What Ardix was able to accomplish with this title was beyond impressive for its time, and the fact that the team is still developing content for it to this day speaks volumes to their dedication as a company and to the game itself. There's something that needs to be said about games from the late 90s to early 2000s that still maintain such a loyal following decades later as well as the development teams that bring their passion to these games long after the wave of popularity has died down. Whether it's teams like Jagex breathing new life into old RuneScape code, or Ardix bringing new adventures every week on 20-year-old software, it's apparent by now that there's more than just pure nostalgia keeping these games alive. There is an inherent aspect of longevity to anything that demonstrates true quality. And as long as there's a way to keep bringing new adventures, stories, gear, and experiences to a game, there will always be a group of people who play them. <laughs>